uh, this next session is going to be fantastic. Um, Shikant is the um, president of Harbinger Systems and all around swell guy I've known for years and um, brilliant organization, brilliant um, HR tech builder of choice. And we're thrilled to have them as an ongoing sponsor and also to have Srikant, president of the company, actually lead this session with some esteemed panelists. We have Andrea from iSIMS um, recently joined there through acquisition, congratulations. And Andy from FutureSolve and also Sam Thayer uh, from the Compass Group will be sharing their points of view on some of the things that uh, Srikant's gonna cover today. So with that, um, Srikant, if you would uh, jump right in, that'd be terrific. Thanks, Ward, and uh, thanks to the HRTA team for hosting this uh, People Analytics uh, event and competition. Uh, glad to be a part of it. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and thanks to all the, my panel, co-panelists as well for being here and allowing me to moderate this uh, session on People Analytics. So when it came to moderating this particular session, one thing that came to my mind is why is People Analytics so important? and <clears throat> what's going to change. Uh, so if you see from a perspective of marketing, right, about a couple of decades back when the whole thing went digital and people had smartphones in their hands and internet was becoming ubiquitous, the whole shift was that how do you market and reach out to this audience and how, what can you sell and how can you sell? So today, when you look at uh, HR, it's going through a similar disruption, like with this whole thing of everything being in an organization or within a, uh, working in a particular environment and driving the whole culture from that perspective and the outcomes from that perspective. Now that's got distributed. It's not just your vendors or the partners that are distributed, but the whole workforce is now distributed. So your own organization is very, very remote. So that, I think creates a lot of opportunity for the digital medium to kick in. And therefore I feel you know, passionate about people analytics and that's probably what's going to drive uh, a lot of decision-making and it's going to play a very important role. So, so from that perspective, it's a very interesting topic. Uh, probably it's going to be uh, in most of the HR sessions that I've attended, analytics has been one of the topmost discussed uh, requirements. So hopefully uh, what I and the uh, panelists are going to talk about today is going to throw some light on some examples and some ideas that we can uh, take away from this particular session. So before I get uh, the panelists on, uh, let me just give you probably an overview of what we can expect towards uh, in this session. So firstly, we will talk about some of the market shifts uh, that the industry is seeing. Uh, then we'll talk about you know, how HR tech has expanded into work tech and, and how that impacts people analytics. And finally, uh, touch base upon integrations and partnerships uh, about how, how to leverage that to, to move our discussion. And lastly, because we are talking about uh, ending in December and starting a new year, uh, it's best to also discuss some emerging trends because that's the flavor of the month. So it'll be good to kind of uh, brainstorm on, on some of the trends and how that affects analytics uh, in some space. So, so that's the plan. Uh, we will have our session in four, four segments and we will uh, have a QA and a towards the end as well where we can have every one of you contribute. But if any one of you has any point, uh, since it's an interactive session, feel free to uh, make a point on the chat or uh, drop in for a question. Um, you're more than welcome. So on that note, let me bring in uh, our panelists and uh, starting with Andrea Wade uh, of ISIMS to introduce herself and tell her about what makes her interested in this particular topic, followed by Andy and Sam. So Andrea, you wanna go? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Shankaz, and thank you uh, more than everyone. I see some familiar faces here. So oh, hi, everyone. Good to see you, I guess, this year. Uh, 
So um, just, uh, I guess, a, a, a quick intro, Andrea Wade, based in Dublin, Ireland. Um, it's getting a little bit dark here. Um, I am Portfolio Director for Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning in ISIMS. Joined ISIMS uh, about seven months ago when our data science startup, Opening.io, was acquired. I was co-founder and CEO of that company. Today, my role, we look at everything that we do from a build, buy, and partner perspective. And today, what I do, uh, if our old company sold into vendors, uh, what we do today is my my uh, my internal co my customers are the CRM, the ATS, the chatbot. And really, what I do is I lead uh, AI ML product across all pro uh, across our entire uh, portfolio. Uh, Sometimes I consult if we're looking at a company, and I don't know if you saw the news yesterday, we've acquired, we made another uh, acquisition, Altru Labs, the award-winning employee-generated video content platform. Um, but really my world is artificial intelligence and machine learning, and we build the algorithms um, and, and um, we, we build from multiple types of solutions, basically. We have an R&D team here in Dublin and we're growing it. And uh, interested in this domain, I suppose, uh, I guess this, this might be important. Why this industry? Until five years ago, I had no background in the industry at all. I've never worked as a recruiter. I've never, nothing. I was a frustrated candidate and a hiring manager. We were getting very interested in uh, AI and machine learning, and we saw our own journey of finding jobs, the journey of our friends and family, and we said, surely this data-heavy, document-heavy industry could benefit from some automation. So we started very innocently, um, 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 and uh, we built, I always tell the story, we built for good outcomes for the candidate by empowering the recruiter. And I'm interested in this because I like solutions, but five years ago, I was like, why not this industry? Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Andy, you want to go next? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, okay. I can. That's great. Yeah, um, well, this is, uh, my name is Andy. I'm a CEO of a company called Future Solve, which is, fut which is focused on the future of work. Uh, a little bit about my background. I've had leadership roles in a lot of talent management companies in the past. I've had probably 16 years plus of experience growing companies, getting them acquired, uh, strategically placing them with partnerships with other organizations. So I have a really good outlook on what uh, the industry has and what can it provide uh, as well. And at FutureSolve, we actually help companies uh, with technology selection. So one of the categories we do have is data analytics. Uh, we have a marketplace and we proactively work with organizations to help them edu be, be educated on technology trends and where technology is going. Many organizations um, really think about technology as a requirement, uh, not thinking about the, the overall outcome or the employee experience focus or the effect on the business. And uh, from a future of work perspective, we are very focused on that. Uh, within FutureSolve, we have over uh, 30 different CHROs, uh, previous CHROs and advisors that actually sit uh, with FutureSolve and help other companies on the future focus. So we are bringing technology and thought leadership together uh, to help with that. So uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Andy. Sam, you wanna go next? Yes, yes. So good morning and or afternoon, depending on where you are or evening. Um, my name is Sam Thayer. I'm the Senior Director of uh, People Analytics for Compass Group for North America. Um, we are a very large contract food service and facilities management company, um, ranging anywhere from the 10th largest to the sixth largest employer of people in the world, depending on you know, what point we're at. And um, and so I've been with the organization 19 years. I have a financial background, HR background, and a technology background. But in essence, I am the business owner, uh, not to be confused with an HRIS team, that drives change within my organization. And so it's varied over the years. Um, I have been working on our analytics solution uh, for the last three years. Uh, it's been pretty much... Uh, I, 
probably about as close as you can get from building to the from the ground up. And um, it's been a game changer for us. Uh, it's something that I'm extremely passionate about um, because I love numbers. Uh, numbers are non-emotional. They have no opinions. They just are. And I think that's why I enjoy them so much. So uh, anyway, so it, all my feedback and input is going to be coming from the end user perspective, uh, from our operations perspective, from our HR perspective. Um, I also supply information to our global board of directors um, on our data uh, and how we're moving, uh, even to the point of uh, investors. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so yeah, great to have this uh, great experience on the panel today and uh, be part of this uh, discussion. So hopefully we can bring different perspectives to, uh, to the table and, and share our experiences. So moving on, uh, getting to the first uh, part of our discussions is addressing what are the key uh, market shifts that, uh, that we are seeing. So to start with, I think what's driving people analytics and is going to increase the demand is, is of course this whole work from home and this huge change that's there for, for HR. So that's why HR is so dependent now uh, on information, as well as employees, uh, CXOs, uh, everybody wants to have a digital connect uh, within the organization. So that's, and that's not going to be uh, short term, it's going to be long term, probably all of 2021. And some of it uh, that's going to continue over a period of years. So, so technologies will have to adapt. And I think people analytics probably is going to play a very important role. Um, one research that uh, Sapien Insights did, and we did this webinar about six months back, right when the pandemic had struck, uh, they said that when they analyzed organizations, mostly they found that data-driven organizations were better dealing with the pandemic and they were collecting a lot more data uh, in their organization and they were able to respond. For example, things like, uh, you know, which workforce can be easily moved to something else because uh, if a particular department had stopped producing any results, what do you do with the whole workforce? Can they be transitioned to something else? So people who collected a lot of data internally uh, were able to do that or handle that transition faster uh, than others. Uh, lastly, the third most important recent happening is about uh, Salesforce acquisition of Slack. Um, and one question that came up to my mind, was it access to data? That's what they're looking for. So, um, I wouldn't want to speak much on that. And probably uh, all my panelists are very close to the market and they're seeing it very closely. I would like to pose this question to them saying that, you know, of course people are spending a lot of time on collaboration tools and probably that's what motivated them. But how do you see it uh, from your eyes or from where you are looking at the market and people analytics? So, so if you want to share your thoughts with the audience, um, is more than happy to facilitate that. Andrea? Sure, thank you. Um, really good question. Um, what, uh, what my take is that this is a um, very smart and timely acquisition. Um, <laughs> it would be weird if I would have a different take if I would know better, but I do think that it is very smart and very timely. Uh, we do see that, you know, 2020, a year that will remain in history uh, of all of us just uh, moving into the future, uh, collaboration tools have seen tremendous growth. And every time, uh, you know, companies survey their employees, what comes back is help us collaborate better. How do we work together better? How do we engage? How do we, and it's not just about work give us a tool where we can randomly have coffee together with someone that we might not know in the company. You know, how do we replace being in a room with not being in a room uh, uh, with, with really powerful technology? So uh, I think, I, I mean, great investment. Uh, and I spent a little bit of time in, 
sort of trying to figure out what their overall angle is. And, and I can give a little bit of detail around that. But from our perspective, right, we have seen, as I said, the growth of these collaboration tools, be it Slack or, or, or Teams. Um, and we actually, in iSIMS, we, this year, we built a, an award-winning integration with Teams uh, because we've seen this future of work. We've seen what our customers need. Uh, and therefore, today, hiring managers, recruiters, team members can conduct interview process, they can provide feedback, um, they can communicate, they, they can do all of this inside teams, right? Um, so, and of course, um, uh, as, a, as someone who has the build by partner outlook out there, we see more and more young companies, startups, which we were uh, as well, tap into where work happens and extract knowledge, extract skills, uh, 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 look into patterns. So we don't just live on, you know, we're not in a, in a room and meetings don't happen face to face. They happen on email on Slack on Teams and so on. So there's a lot of good data to extract there uh, in order to build tools that automate and, and add layers of intelligence. Now, what do Slack <laughs> and, and, and Salesforce have in plan? What I, I read is that, you know, Salesforce's view was that they were missing a communication layer on top of its all other products. So really what they want Slack to become is this next generation interface for customer 360. They have so many products. Uh, uh, they have partners in their clients, customer service, sales, tech. They, what they want to do is get a, rid of email. They want to take clicks away and they want to add this overall uh, comms layer onto everything that they have. Also, because they have a very interesting, um, very unique vision in how machines and humans work together and how work happens uh, in this digital environment. The products will do the work and how do you fit in, in, in those workflows? So I think it's very interesting before, again, and this is the last thing that I'll say for us, uh, collaboration platforms present a rich data pool in understanding how we work, what skills we acquire, who do we work with, what are the team's dynamics, uh, and so on. So um, yeah, that's that's my take on it. Um, uh, it's pretty exciting what they are doing. Thanks, Andrea. That, that those were great points of how you outlined, um, how you see the acquisition. Maybe I'll go to Andy uh, to, uh, to ask him how he sees it uh, from an HR and work tech perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, from my side, I feel like there's a, still a disjoint between the lab that's studying the data and the executives that are looking at the data to the real people generating the data on the floor. And uh, communication platforms provide the full insight and the full analytics of what's happening on the floor in the employee with the customer during the communication that there's a lot of things that may emerge of that. It's uh, I think it's not just a data play, but it's also a communication play because today uh, all of these systems that Salesforce has are more about process and procedure and attracting employees to go into that to do the procedure or, or follow the process uh, versus going to the employee themselves. So this is helping them to get adoption, helping them to make the process easier, helping to reach the end user in a much strategic, much more strategic way. Um, we, we have a similar vision at FutureSolve where uh, there should be one front end that helps the employee or the for consumer uh, on all areas, uh, whether you're doing your personal life or business life. And from that, it will pull on the right strategies or workflows that are needed on the background. Um, so we will continually see uh, companies move in that direction where they have uh, integrations or partnerships with systems that will allow them to be front-facing, um, specifically even data sites. Uh, so if we are looking at the right data, we should be definitely front-facing and focused on front-facing. Yeah, Andy, that makes a lot of sense from where you see it, like using one single tool uh, 
as an interface, as a primary interface, and then you know everything else, collecting information and that. So or delivering not, through that, correct? It, it will eventually become a delivery medium, just like we're delivering through email today. That might change in the future. So, so yeah, moving on to you, Sam. Um, your thoughts from you're running a large uh, business and large uh, number of people. So, how do you see this acquisition? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything that was just just said. Is the the needs of the business are changing, and have to change at a pace where most are expecting a revolution, and it's more of an evolution. And yeah. with us, as quickly as we've been moving, um, I think we go slow. Um, those that support us, third parties, think we're moving at, at lightning speed. Um, but there is this, there is this um, disconnect between the, the true analytic shop, the, the, the new type of analytics team for HR there is, um, corporate employee, uh, like the senior leaders, the executives, and everyone has this different lens that they, they look at in trying to get all of them on the same page and same understanding can be um, extraordinarily difficult to make happen. It just takes time. Um, so where I thought, like where we are today, I thought we would be a year ago. Um, mm -hmm. But then you, you speak with some and they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you've gotten that much done. And I'm like, well, um, don't let my team hear you say that because then they're gonna slow down. Um, but it's just as much communication as it is anything else. Um, so it is, communicating and understanding um, just as much as even the, the metrics that we run. Um, that I think that's core to what any group can support. So when you're, when you're out there and you're building products from the ground up or you're evolving um, your product that you do have or you're out there acquiring new companies, um, some, sometimes you just have to keep things simple and let those that you support learn over time and as they gain understanding, then you expand more. Um, because I mean, I was I've been looking at products all week where I, I think they're cool, uh, but I know if I even try and talk to my customer, my internal customer base on it, I'm gonna lose them. Because uh, because you know, like someone said earlier, we're not analytics people. Um, so you just have, you have to balance it. Thanks, Sam. Thanks uh, for sharing your perspective. So that uh, is an interesting uh, topic to move into our next section, which is about, you know, what's the data source when it comes to uh, people analytics? And we think that uh, from where we are seeing it at Harbinger, it's not just HR, it's, it's expanding in both directions. Uh, it's going towards collaboration tools like uh, we, we talked about and productivity tools. So productivity tools could be examples of Salesforce, collaboration, maybe Teams and so forth. And HR is probably having to, uh, and when you're talking about people analytics, it's not just restricted to the data that's available within HR. So we will have to pull in information from all these systems to be able to do better um, and serve better uh, for the for the enterprise needs and examples of those could be taking faster actions, uh, nudging on learning uh, based on where the user is, uh, managing a distributed workforce intelligently either through collaboration tools or productivity depending on where they are using it and doing things. Uh, measuring of course learning and training effectiveness, uh, correlating productivity and uh, engagement. So if you have to do all these things. Uh, definitely you have to draw a connection uh, between collaboration, HR, and productivity tools. And some of the things we've seen in addition to what Salesforce and Slack has done is there's already partnerships announced between Microsoft Workday uh, for better use of Teams and Azure. Uh, same between Workday and Salesforce partnerships uh, for better productivity and back to work solutions. So you see there is a lot of syn uh, synchronization happening uh, within the industry. So that which enables uh, people analytics to go to the next uh, level. One more thing that's that's important and what we need to understand is 
integrations, uh, not everybody can go and buy everything out there. I mean, of course, Salesforce could uh, buy Slack, but not everybody can do that. So, so obviously the next best thing that people can do is, is to integrate well and, and provide that seamless experience. So, so in many of our, and most of the integrations when, when we do from an analytics perspective, it is to drive uh, business outcomes. So typically when you use a single tool, you are focused on things like increasing the efficiency or effectiveness. But when you integrate, you are really want to drive a business outcomes. And therefore, um, if you're not a single platform, uh, if you're collaborating with many platforms and providing the solutions, uh, there are approaches uh, that, uh, that you can do. Uh, and that's going to be focus of our next section of discussion uh, uh, with the panel members of how to, you know, use intelligent integrations and partnerships to, to help us uh, do deliver better uh, people analytics. So on that note, let me bring in the panelists uh, once again and, and start with uh, Andy uh, and ask his experience uh, specifically around integrations um, to help people analytics and or data analytics. Uh, what, what's your uh, view um, and how have you leveraged integrations and partnerships? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm involved in a couple of um, artificial intelligent data analytics platforms that do various things. Um, I'm usually seeing um, two different strategies. So one is the technology is there, but then they're integrating very well with a database or a data scraper somewhere or a data feed that will get them information that would help them in their strategies. Um, or uh, we're also seeing uh, strong AI platforms that are either having their own data or white labeling it on the background without actually showing it as an integration to say, this is a platform that comes with that data. Um, overall, I am seeing a lot of uh, higher evaluations on companies that have either white labeled or have some ownership on the data in the background and it's fully embedded into their platform because it's not just a data analytics, but it's a data uh, and analytics play together. Um, uh, if you're doing an integration strategy, it's uh, crucial on what you do with the data. So if you're just delivering the data in a very, uh, another method, um, I don't think that's very innovative. It's what are you solving with that data gets really strong. So if you have any predictive models, or if you have ways of solving uh, ways where it provides more insight into the data and it's researching the data and analyzing it for the user, then that's uh, strategic intellectual property innovation in that area. So whichever direction you go in, I would also encourage either by having that innovative way of analyzing the data and providing some really good insights that before that user or that buyer is not able to, or uh, it's white label and strategically placed where not only are you delivering the data, but it's it's packaged together. So people are getting data plus analytics in one place. A great point, uh, Andy. And uh, from a white labeling perspective, uh, I know it's it's a, you, you live in the background, but are you seeing um, more openness to white label uh, and people being able to do that or? I, I am seeing that. I'm seeing that not from the large companies. So uh, there's a lot of data scrapers that power the large organizations that uh, people don't know their names, but they're in the background powering a lot of systems. Uh, when you go to them, that's their model. Their model is to deliver data and have it always available in your platform. And they make uh, a certain subscription or percentage as you grow as well. And, and they like that. So you just need to find that right partner in that area. That makes sense. I think that's an interesting point about white labeling when it comes to data analytics. Uh, so thanks for that. Uh, moving on to our uh, next question uh, to, to Sam. Uh, Sam, since you are uh, on the organization side, looking at various tools and probably even building a lot of tools, uh, what would be your advice to, to technologies that you're looking to buy 
uh, from a data analytics perspective, is it from startups? What, what are you looking at it uh, from a data analytics and integration perspective? How are you, uh, what advice would you have if there were startups here? So two different things. And you know, I say this from the perspective of, of a large organization. So maybe small organizations wouldn't have the uh, same type of need. But the first and foremost, which I think sometimes gets lost in the shuffle because everyone's very focused on the end product that's going to be developed and delivered, is speed to market. So you can have the best tool in the world, but if you can't get it up and running in a reasonable amount of time, um, it, it puts an enormous amount of stress on the organization to start producing because you're, you're shelling cash out for it. So um, just being able to say, I can get, and it being realistic with the, the client base, I can get your data up and running in the following phases and maybe you know one phase per month so you're continuing to, to expand. The one piece that I think um, would be good as a bolt-on, uh, because most are gonna wanna buy off the shelf, uh, so plug and play, I'm gonna give you my data sets, you give me something that's predefined, and then I'm running. But there's this piece where for the large organizations, typically we do have a true blue analytics shop. So, the, so although the majority um, use within my group um, is tied to, to a platform we, uh, through a third party provider, um, I do have PhD level statisticians on our team that, that code in Python and R, and they do very sophisticated analyses for us um, that you just can't get off the shelf because they're, they're, they're so niche, you're not gonna find it. And so then the question becomes, okay, well, when they do that work, can you bake that into the platform that you have um, and not have to redo it? Not, you know, where they build something one time and then they can walk away or the care and feeding for whatever the analysis was, they can just update very easily. Uh, but then that gets back into what Andy was talking about is that your analytics tool is just as much a communication vehicle than it is. So you get the information, you communicate the information out and you automate it. And, and to kind of give everybody an idea of what I'm talking about from just a sheer volume um, of data that we produce, because on top of this, you, you need to have a system that can handle a large volume of data. So for us, just US operation pre-COVID, uh, 262,000 associates. And as it stands right now, and I know I'm gonna miss one, but I'll just rattle it through. Uh, we have SAP master data, nine box succession, talent acquisition through success factors, learning, uh, budgeted comp, actual pay, um, fringe benefits, insurance, um, sales data, COVID market data, um, collective bargaining agreements, financial data at the GL code level, uh, market data for unemployment and compensation. And so, and, and there's more, but when you're, when, you're, when you're basically opening up the package and, and it's live, it's running all of this data. You can't keep up. And so, because we have 28 companies in a very complex structure, um, we have a tendency to really, um, sometimes quite frankly, break a vendor. Um, and that's the very first thing I tell new vendors is we're gonna break you. If you can handle us, you can handle just about anybody, but it's about as complicated as, as you can get. And so designing for the most complicated company out there um, and have the ability to flex up in when you need to, I think is important. But that, but right now from what I'm seeing, I have not seen a vendor that allows you to code in their system on the back end for ad hoc and produce it through that platform. Haven't seen it yet. That's a great point. Maybe we can go back to the audience later and uh, enlighten us on that topic. So, uh, but, but yeah, I think you stated the complexity of the problem. So of course, I think it will be good to see some solutions, uh, how, how people are coming up with this in terms of approaching uh, people analytics and data analytics. So um, moving on to our next question, let me, I think I lost my share screen, which is to Andrea. I'll bring it up in a second here. So, so Andrea, the question to you is uh, basically your platform plugs into, plugs into many enterprises and uh, 
you are on the AI ML side trying to create solutions. So obviously you are collecting data in your tool as well as also accessing information probably of the organization. So how are you dealing with the situations where, you know, the data, to whom the data belongs and how do you uh, make sure, you know, you are comfortable with the data you have and you have it in enough volume that you can do the AI ML on top of it. So any, any thoughts, any, any views on that? Sure. I mean, I can um, I can start by giving a view of um, that addresses, you know, um, specifically this question around the data challenges, and then we 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 moved into into specifics. And and this is a really good question and one that, as in the past, uh, the company that uh, I, I co-founded um, uh, dealt with and sold to other vendors. It was it was a very important. Um, uh, and a very uh, challenging part of scaling, right? But because it, when you look, I think before looking at what are the data challenges, I think we need to look at why are they? You know, why are the challenges? And this is the framework that we tried to, to, to look at companies when we tried to work with them. And then I can give you the perspective from now as well. When you think of companies' data strategies, I'll use this, this kind of dual framework of having a, a defensive strategy and offensive strategy when it comes to data. Defensive strategy, we're talking about objectives that are around ensuring data security, ensuring data privacy, integrity, quality, uh, government, regulatory compliance, and so on. So some of the activities that relate to these defensive uh, kind of objectives are things like optimizing data extraction, standardization, storage, access, and then everything looks to, to an architectural way that a company uh, uh, stores their data, or whatever, if it's a single source of, of, of truth or not. When you look at the of like a, a, an offensive kind of a, a, a data strategy. Um, and that was the world that we productized for. And this is where data analytic products are put together for in order to help companies with their uh, data uh, offense is improve competitive positioning and pro profitability, optimize data analytics, modeling, uh, visualization, transformation, enrichment. And here we're talking about architectures that where data is everywhere, right? And, and when we build these products, we have to build for capturing that risk and making sure giving uh, enterprises that confidence that their defense is, uh, uh, the risk is lowered or it's in accordance with their strategy, uh, but then you have to build for this offense, uh, um, offensive kind of uh, data strategy. And in here, of course, especially in our world where we deal with highly sensitive data for many reasons, we have people's addresses, we have, you know, we have information uh, that that is highly uh, uh, private, you know, and it, it relates to race, to sexual orientation, to whatever it might be. Um, and especially as we were born here in Europe, and we have the GDPR, uh, tapping into data, working with data, uh, accessing the data, and who owns the data, is the answer to that is always the candidate. We have to remember that. It's not employee uh, X or employee uh, Y, it's always the candidate. Um, but this is why we need to build and move as fast as or slow us, but it, it, thankfully some of these things uh, uh, are, are moving. Uh, the regulatory kind of uh, 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 and, and compliance uh, uh, structures are moving. So we had GDPR here. We now have, I think there's something uh, in New York, the New York state is looking at introducing explainability. There is a thing called the right to explain around uh, algorithmic uh, decision-making. So it's, if we understand who the data belongs to, always the candidate. And then if we put in the right uh, uh, um, OKs around data um, and, and the right defensive kind of data strategies, um, then, then, then we can build. But I, I do believe strongly that although, you know, we, we build AI ML cases, we, we, be, we strongly believe in data privacy and GDPR roles and we shouldn't, 
be able to do whatever we want with candidate data and candidates should be able to see what we do with their data, how some of these products influence uh, uh, the features and the, uh, that are being built, how their data is productized. If you look at all the uh, outside of our industry, all the free products that we use, you, you've, we've all heard this 50 million times that if it's free, you are the product. Um, so as we build on top of candidate data, we just need to make sure that, that um, we, we, we keep that in mind. And then obviously whatever else is, is, is happening um, from a compliance and regulatory um, level. And we need, we need the okay. Um, I can say just one more thing. We're looking at internal mobility at the moment and we're looking at uh, tapping into data points that will show the true you in a, in a specific job six months later. So maybe I have no project management skills today, but I decide to join some internal uh, collaboration project uh, internal in, 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 my, um, in my company, but not necessarily linked to my job. Six months later, I know project management. Can we pull this data out and help you provide a fuller, truer uh, a version of you, but make sure that we ask for your okay, uh, um, um, in order for us to tap into whatever data signals we can, if it's Slack conversations or Zoom meetings, which you can record and you can have live transcribing uh, and so on. So um, that's my very long answer to that. Thanks, thanks, Andrea. Those are good points about uh, you know explainable AI and data analytics companies creating a defensive and offensive strategy. So uh, important tips for for people to look for. Uh, while they are building uh, systems that leverage uh, candidate data, organization data, um, and also have their own internal data to kind of all mix together. Uh, so, so on that note, let's move to the last section of our uh, presentation today, which is about uh, you know what's in store in future, what's the emerging trends and design trends that are out there. Um, maybe as we step into 2021, what are the things that we should look at? Um, from, we looked at various trends and three things that uh, came, uh, looked important to us and for, uh, for companies out there who are building or using technology um, might be important uh, in the coming two to three years would be, one is about hyper automation, uh, second is about internet of behaviors and third is about total experience. So. Hyper automation probably brings together RPA, AI, ML all together uh, so that, you know, you can take decisions in real time. So example, you know, instead of doing pulse surveys or annual surveys, uh, if by looking at chat conversations or what's happening on collaboration tools, you could judge the pulse of an organization or a pulse of a division. That's, that's going to be real time and how, how probably people monitor traffic as to now it's here, where's it going? Uh, so, so that kind of technology probably is coming and we probably have to leverage it in our products. The second important thing um, because of the whole remote workforce is, and probably 5G coming in is internet of behaviors. You will have a lot of places where uh, tools and uh, beacons will be put to measure uh, how people are reacting, how they're doing things. Uh, and all of this information collected probably will help you design a safer, better workplace um, that's remote and, and still pro highly productive. So, so that's probably uh, something out in the future that technology and product companies will tap into. Uh, and the third most important thing when it comes to HR and technology is about ex total experience, right? I mean, we heard in previous sessions also, and even now that, you know, uh, the view of HR is expanding and the number of stakeholders that HR talks to is, is also expanding. So, uh, so if you have to provide a complete experience, you have to cater to all the users in the system. Uh, so for example, if, you, if you're providing a recruitment platform, then the candidates, the, uh, the recruiters, uh, the HR uh, employees, everybody has to experience it in a complete way. It cannot be favored in one uh, to a particular user. Uh, otherwise, you know, the, the outcome uh, may not be there. So, so probably 
uh, from all the trends out there, uh, when it comes to HR um, and data analytics, uh, we thought, or I thought that these three may be relevant uh, for future. So I thought I'll probably present that. Uh, you'll find many more. And that's what I want to uh, ask the panelists view on, saying that uh, uh, finally, uh, if there were any other thoughts that you had, of course, I had a few questions, but any different thoughts about data analytics um, and, and future uh, technology trends or any of those things you would like to share uh, before we open it up uh, to, the, to the audience. Andrea, you want to go first? Sure, sure, thank you. Um, so, yeah, great question. And uh, it is part of the, the, the world that I, uh, I live in, just imagining uh, the future or understanding it. So sometimes you don't have to imagine it, it's smack back arrives uh, and you wake up in it as we did in 2020. I can tell you that, um, you, you know, if you go in and, and you, you look at, you know, different type of tra trends, something that we are working on now and we're planning for the next 12 months and beyond uh, and, and something that we came into ISIMS with is, uh, you know, well, the knowledge graphs coupled with the data that we're able to tap into coming into a company like ISIMS where you have 300 million uh, uh, resumes and billions of, of, of candidate data points is um, uh, these graph enable and boost this digital dexterity uh, um, that is able to deliver insights into work patterns, um, individual skills development, career pathing, uh, um, uh, that is all needed in a world that is partly remote or, or fully remote or, or whatnot. I think the future will see that, you know, this year many things have happened and, and we see this growth uh, and true interest and willingness to, to bring in, uh, to provide access and bring in uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, not just as an afterthought, but as a foundational core DNA. It's not the icing on the cake, it's the cake uh, uh, of any uh, uh, product development, I guess. So if we look at higher anywhere, um, I'm hoping that the world will open next year and, and will be great, but it will take a while. And, and some companies have decided they will stay in this remote or, or hybrid kind of world. So with that, having access to much larger data pools uh, uh, of candidates, we, what we will probably see is in the next three years, the number of people with disabilities uh, you know, finally having access or having more access to the workforce will double or, or triple uh, because suddenly you don't have to, you know, drive somewhere, you don't have to take a bus somewhere, you can work from home. So access, I believe it's a really, really big one. Job and role changes, right? I think uh, um, um, uh, we were doing some research, um, kind of forward looking research three, four years from now, up to 50 to 60 percent uh, uh, a manager currently does will be automated uh, requiring a complete overhaul of, 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 of that particular um, of the role of the manager and I can see that as well in, in my work what is something that is core exact to, to what I do and what I can see that it, it will become automated um, with this as well, in the next, let's say, four or five years, learning and development, uh, this area will be impacted um, as maybe up to 50% of, of the budgets uh, as they are today will be eliminated because uh, uh, a big chunk of tasks will be automated. So how we look at, uh, at learning and development will, will really change ethics. Two, three years from now, we actually came up with our code of ethics uh, last month. Uh, it's supposed to be now, but in two, three years tops, we will see that anyone who works in analytics, anyone who works in AI, it doesn't matter where your role is, um, will have to demonstrate expertise uh, in 
responsible development of AI. What does that mean? The world is putting that together, trying to figure that together now, right? Um, and then I guess the last piece that I will say is, and, and we see this outside of our industry and it will impact our industry as well and how we work and how our role changes is content, correspondence, uh, uh, documentation. Again, next three, four years, about 80% of the things that we put out there uh, uh, in, in our role will be either kind of correspondence that is recycled or it's filled in uh, uh, by, uh, by AI and automation uh, through uh, auto-completion. We see this in the email already. We see in the Gmail, you start writing a thing and it completes. Um, so a lot of things will change in how we work um, and how, uh, I guess, um, humanity works. Um, so I, I think it's all, um, it's all pretty interesting and um, we're all here for it to, to make sure that we guard um, what we bring to the table, which is humanity and a smile, I guess. Great, great points, Andrea. Thank you for that, uh, for expanding on what I started. But Andy, uh, over to you for your thoughts. Yeah, so there's a few areas that um, we're actively working on um, and putting a few products or partners together to address, but um, a big one that's an initial need in the recruiting space is actually um, AI sourcing. Um, so there's uh, a need on how do we use artificial intelligence to find people that are passive? How do we reach out to them with that passive message and how to uh, invite them to be part of the organization. Um, there's also artificial intelligence that is studying uh, a resume versus a true profile of a person online, right? So a lot of people put things in the resume because the ATS is right now out of a formula. If you don't have that keyword, you will not be selected. And those formulas are very disjointed from the true person that that person is. So if they put who they are truly on paper, most of the time they never get a call back. So AI is starting to look at how do we innovate that, that area and have a true profile outlook on that person based on who they are on the internet, right? Based on projects, involvement, things they're doing, even in other organizations, how do we get access to that type of data? Uh, another uh, piece that I'm also uh, working on, and it's uh, a focus on the future of work, is uh, there's a lot of things that AI could help with when you're trying to understand a person's capability. Um, back in the day, you have to take a long personality assessment. And based on a personality assessment, we try to put you with a team based on other complementary personalities. Uh, but we know personality is not everything. There's technical skills, there's ability to learn, there's all types of things. So if AI could bring all of those different areas together to also form a picture about an executive, for example, uh, on how well can they deliver an organization and forecast that into the future, then now you're making decisions based on proactive ROI that you can generate, right? Uh, eventually, this could be used as, you know, how do you appoint a, a, the CEO of a new company? If a company is going public, what can you do to structure that and, and help with that? Or if you're setting up a new innovation team, right, what are the right pieces to bring them together to have a, a proactive, successful innovation team, right, in your, in your labs? And R and D. So those are things that um, we're seeing a lot of, um, and we're getting a lot of actually questions about. Uh, there's even money to be spent in those areas, but uh, not everybody has the silver bullet or answer yet. Uh, I'm seeing those, uh, and then I'm also seeing, uh, like you mentioned, is how do we uh, understand the organization without proactively making employees do things, right? From what they say, from how they interact, from the involvement from uh, how they uh, respond to the manager. You know, we can get a lot of insight to that. Just like if I'm a person and I'm interacting with somebody, I get some insight. 
can AI get close enough to get those insights? Uh, then that will also help the organizations to get a very good picture on where they are and what's, what's going on. Um, but those are the three areas that I'm seeing from my end. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Thanks for those uh, final thoughts. And Sam, uh, from you. Uh... Yeah, so well, first of all, I would have to tell you, I've been pretty impressed with what both of you had to say and share during this session. It's, um, for me, it's pretty inspiring to know and understand um, where your, your mind is. Um, in HR, all it comes down to is talent. That's, I mean, really in a nutshell, anything focused in on talent is going to get you where you need to be and everything feeds into that. The area where I think that we're going to see the most movement but have the biggest need is trying to get into the area of qualitative um, in addition to quantitative. It's not easy to do. That's why there's a lot of people doing it. And, and to kind of give you an idea of what that would look like from a talent perspective is valuing soft skills. And so when I look at our organization, we have over 12,000 locations, 28 companies just in the United States that have labor that sits in them. And when things aren't going well, it's usually tied to someone's inability to manage. They're, they're a unit director and they're, they're having challenges. And then the question becomes why? Is it the training? Is it the personality? But you always get into these discussions that are very difficult to measure and to drill in because there, there may not be dollars or, or numbers associated with that. Um, so my question would be is if, if, you, could, if you could measure um, the soft skills with an employee, find out what is most successful for an organization, tie those to your, your learning programs and develop them to track them over time, and then continue at your path to see if it impacts revenue. And so you're measuring one area that really hasn't been touched that much. I mean, yes, it's been touched from a personality profile analysis. And, you know, I've even seen some analysis that have to do with people's, um, their beliefs. It's right there on an edge, um, usually nonprofit, uh, faith-based nonprofit organizations can usually put those type of analyses. Uh, it's a value-based evaluation. Um, and there has been that connection, but there's not been the connection that I've seen so far that is, that's moving us from people analytics, what I like to call decision analytics. Great and wonderful, you can measure it. But what is the decision that we're making now? What, what decision are we making to put a training program together to teach somebody or enhance something somebody already has to take them to that next level? And once they learn that, what does that then result in? And then as you follow that trail, the, the very last step is it increases revenue. It increases margin, um, which in turn, uh, puts money in the pockets of the investors. So you know, like in our world, uh, for the most part, our HR professionals, we're business, prof uh, we're business professionals with an HR overlay. And so the end result is the business side, but the people side is so extraordinarily difficult because it's all about personalities. It's all about how people feel and what they think and what they believe and and those are the things that are very difficult to measure. So I'm hoping we're gonna, we're gonna see advancement in that area. I think that's what's gonna come. I know my team is working on a portion of that now, um, trying to get from qualitative to quantitative. And then, then as far as platforms themselves, I think the trend's going to continue of, it's in your back pocket, you know, I'm, I'm you know, most, most HR professionals, at least for larger corporations, uh, they're out in the business. They're not sitting in front of their computer. They don't have the time to put fancy charts together. They just pull their phone out uh, and they're interacting on that. And so I think um, we'll see that advanced um, over time. Cool, thanks, Sam. And uh, I think uh, we don't have slides, time for any more slides. So I'll just go to the thank you slide. Uh, of course, there was a lot covered, and my takeaway probably was only 
uh, four points, so which probably didn't do justice to the whole conversation. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, we are probably out of time. Otherwise, we could have uh, opened it up for questions. But I see some great points on chat, uh, and some of you have been able to respond to that. So that's great. Uh, once again, thank you to uh, all three of you, Andrea and Andy and Sam, to participate in this uh, panel discussion and share your views on people analytics and uh, you know what you see as the future. So thank you and I wish all of you a great day. And to all the listeners, uh, thank you for, for your active participation.